On this week's NFE SD and Rally Check, we speak with Barry Graham from the TM Forum on connecting NFE islands and also on the firm's upcoming TM Forum live event in Nice, France. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us this week. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer, I'm Editor-in-Chief at RCR Wireless News, and, and this week we are joined by Barry Graham, who's the uh, Program Director for the Agile Program at TM4, to talk a bit about uh, about the organization and also about some topics in terms of virtualization. So, Barry, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Uh, hi, Dan. It's, it's good to be here. Great. Well, maybe start off with, uh, for those who don't know much about the TM4, maybe a little overview of, of the organization and kind of what you guys uh, what you guys do, what you guys, uh, what you guys specialize in. Yeah, sure. So the, uh, the TM Forum's uh, an industry association. Um, many people think of us as a standards body, and, and we do generate standards, but we think of ourselves more as an industry association. We started in, in telecoms, um, but we now have membership that's much wider, looking across pretty much the whole digital services ecosystem. Um, we're really about helping our members make money. Uh, we, we see huge opportunity in the marketplace today. We see huge transformation that's going to happen. We've been doing this for 27 years. We've seen many generations of transformation. Um, but we're about the business side of things. So we're about looking at the technology, looking at the marketplace and saying, well, how do I make, how, how do I make a successful, thriving business in this? So we work collaboratively. Uh, we collaboratively develop best practices, models. A common language is one of the key things we do. Uh, if, we, if we look at orchestration, for example, one of the key pieces of work we're doing right now is an end-to-end -end orchestration architecture. We had 50 people in the room uh, at a meeting in Lisbon a couple of months ago, and it turned out that everybody had a slightly different understanding of what we meant by orchestration. Um, and so what we're doing is pulling together a common reference frame, just a simple diagram that says, this is what we mean by service orchestration, this is what we mean by resource orchestration. We don't do that from a technology up point of view, we do it from a business down. So why does that matter to the business? It matters because I have to procure things, it matters because I have to be able to talk to partners, it matters because I have to be able to quickly stand up digital services with my partners. So we need to be talking a common language. And we work together with members across the digital services player to create just those things. So that's kind of what the forum does. say It's expanded recently, but it's pretty much core to what we've been doing for a number of years. Yeah, well, I would say anybody who's been in the telecom market for any, any amount of time would, uh, would realize the importance of having a common language for most things. And obviously, technology is evolving so rapidly in the telecom space. But again, it does seem like at times people are, are perhaps saying the same things, but the words aren't quite the same. And so, yeah, and even just that, that aspect of what you guys do uh, is, is very important to the, to the industry for sure. So uh, that's a good part of it there. But I guess maybe before we dig into some specific topics, I guess what's the general view, uh, I guess, from TM Foreman, and I guess how the, the, the development and perhaps deployment and evolution of, of virtualized platforms using NFV and SDN, how have those kind of, uh, I guess, uh, evolved, that's the right word for it, uh, in the telecom space over the past you know, year or two for, from your guys', your guys point of view, maybe where we are today in terms of, of that development and that deployment? I mean, that's a really interesting space for us and our members and a really interesting question, obviously. Um, we did a report 12 months ago, and then we repeated it very recently, surveying our members as to where they were with NFV deployment and where they were in terms of what were the big challenges to, to deploying NFV. And um, this year, I think the number was 37.5. The report is, uh, is on our website, of course. But um, I think it's 37.5% of the members we surveyed said they had NFV in live commercial deployment. So they've got virtual uh, functions in some way in their live network. And that's, that's the big number. That's an awful lot of stuff out there. Um, what we're not so sure yet is that, is that they're getting the benefits from that. It's not at all clear that people are actually building any new services built on this, but they're certainly deploying it. Um, we characterize this as we know how to make it work. It's not clear that we're quite at the phase where we know how to make money out of it yet. That's an interesting point of view because yeah, I, I know we were talking offline a little bit, but I've talked to a few people recently about this topic, and it does seem like that, like you said, there, there is uh, NFV deployments are happening. Operators are are moving forward to this. The, you know, the really aggressive operators are moving pretty rapidly in, in this in this format. But it does seem like that there is a bit of disconnect at this point as to really uh, using those deployments efficiently enough to really start to see some sort of return on them. Because again, it, it sounds like what you're saying. Maybe we're still so early in the process that you know we're not quite to that step yet. Uh, but it does seem like at some point uh, operators are going to need to start maybe, you know, not just deploying these, 
but maybe even start to drive some efficiencies, some revenues, uh, some new business opportunities for me. So, so it seems like from your point of view, we're still not quite uh, to that level yet. Where we're, you know, again, again, it's important to get deployments out there to get some experience, but to actually uh, make these things run efficiently and get some efficiency out of them, we're still not quite there yet, it seems. Yeah, and it's not just about efficiency, right? I mean, we, we kind of looked in both of the reports we did, and we've done a number of workshops on this as well. So what do you have to do to, to make money and exploit NFV um, as a technology? And it turns out, if you look at what people are saying are the big pieces of work they need to do, a lot of it is about changing the processes. So we talk about needing a DevOps kind of mentality. Well, that's a completely different way of thinking to the way that operations teams have thought in the telco space. So this isn't just, a, oh, we need to change some processes. What people talk about is a whole cultural change. Right. So what we're seeing is really, okay, I've deployed the technology, but I've got some much bigger things to do in order to really be able to take benefit of that within my organization, within the deep in the culture of my organization, even in the way my organization is put together. I've got to make some pretty big changes in order to be in a position to exploit those. And that kind of business transformation is something that we've been talking about the planning of for a couple of years. Our Zoom project from the beginning has been in doing these kind of transformation requirements work. Now what we're trying to do and that the members are absolutely focusing on is, okay, we're at that point. As you say, we've got the infrastructure deployed so we could start to use it. Now we've got to start making those changes to our processes, and to our IT systems so that we can really take the benefit from it. Yeah, I mean, so I guess in, I, I guess the technology aspect, that was almost, not that it was easy, but that was almost the easier part of this transition because again, like you're saying, and from the carriers I've talked to, that, that, um, that, that organiza organizational change, that really getting uh, the, the workforce uh, in line with this new model, that does seem to be uh, a bigger challenge and maybe one that's gonna take, you know, some of these organizations are quite large. And so this could be a multi-year type of process, which, uh, you know, again, the technology part of it is, is, is there, uh, but that part seems to be uh, a bit of a hurdle that can be uh, perhaps a, a much trickier subject uh, for operators to really try to tackle. And obviously, you guys are working to help them out there, but that seems like a big challenge for these, for these operators now. Yeah, I mean, it comes up as the top challenge time and time again, and it, it, it's, um, it, it it's becoming more of the top challenge in terms of the percentage of people who say that's their biggest challenge. We've gone from about 50, 60% saying that was our biggest challenge to like 70% now. Um, and uh, we had a great uh, summit, uh, leadership summit in Amsterdam um, ooh, back a month ago, I think it was. And we had a, a whole day workshop where we got about uh, 20 different operating companies in there discussing brainstorming ways that have worked for them in terms of how you start making that change. And it's quite interesting. It's, it's so far from the technology that they're, they're talking about um, getting the KPIs that the whole organization is measured on, getting those changed. So that's a fundamental thing. We've got we've got a whole organization that, that's that's been running to a beat of particular KPIs. We all know what's important. We've actually got to change some of those and some of the ways departments relate to each other, particularly IT and network operations who have traditionally not been tightly integrated. So it's that level of transformation, and sure, it's going to take time, but we are seeing a number of people coming to us with best case uh, examples of best practice use cases of how they've started to make that transformation. Yeah, I mean, can you touch a bit about, I mean, what you've heard from those operators? I mean, what would be a good starting point for, say, an operator that is looking to make this transition uh, and it's looking at its workforce and looking at its current models? You know, what would be a good, perhaps, first step in, in making that, that transition? Because, again, obviously, it's going to be a multi-step process and multi-year process, but what's a good uh, way to at least get the ball rolling? Because that's, that's usually probably the most difficult part is just getting that process uh, underway. Yeah, I mean... I, I, let me give you an example. Uh, I, I forget which operator it was, but, the, but they were at a um, they were at one of our leadership summits, and they said that what they'd done is they'd they'd taken a new service, and and this touches to a hybrid point I want to come back to as well. But they'd taken a new service, and they had created a completely separate um, team, but but a cross functional team. So they had IT people, they had marketing people, and they'd actually created sort of a a silo the other way, if you like, within the, they'd given this team all the people they needed. I love that phrase because if, if you read sort of the Agile manifesto, it says the team should have everybody it needs as part of the team and only the people it needs. So they actually took that and they said, right, for this new service, we're going to put the whole piece together a little bit separate to the rest of the business. We're going to lift a couple of IT people, lift a couple of networking people, 
and we're going to put those guys together and we're going to get that team to launch a service. And they did it. What they're now doing is they're taking the lessons learned from that and they're saying, okay, how do we now replicate that across the, the organization? And from the forum's point of view, that, that's really where we're focusing now. As I said, we're kind of, we've done the, this is what, a, what you need to transform. And we're starting to build the key assets that people actually need to do this stuff. So we're starting to push out the APIs that people need to actually put the services together. And they can take all those assets it's hard to change the whole organization, but just change a small piece of it. Just take something and pilot it and end to end do something in a new way and learn from that, show that to everybody, and then you can help to learn across the organization. So I heard one operator talking through that story and that to me seemed a, a really brave and powerful way to get something done. Yeah, and it seems like too, I mean, you obviously need to have uh, that support at an operator from the top down really to make this happen because uh, again, obviously, the, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the work is going to be done by people perhaps more in the middle of your organization. But if you don't have that kind of support from the top to really say, hey, we need to do this, there might, there might be some challenges along the way. Uh, you know, there might be some, you know, even some financial uh, uh, decisions have to be made about this. But this is a, this is a way we need to go. Uh, and, and so it seems like you really need to have that kind of support from the top down. And obviously, you guys work with a lot of the top, you know, sea level uh, uh, people as well. So it seems like that's kind of the, the, the main, main aspect of this is make sure you've got that, that kind of support from the top down to make sure this can be uh, uh, seen through the whole process. Yeah, and I, I think the other piece that came in, look at it from the business point of view. So yeah. people often ask me, what's the difference between what we're doing and what Etsy are doing, for example. And, and, and Etsy are doing some incredible work in terms of building things from the technology up there. Um, that they're looking at really detailed technical pieces that absolutely need to be there. But our members tend to come at this from the, okay, we understand that those technical bits and pieces are there. We understand that this works. How do we actually bring this within to our business? And, and you see that from, for example, one of our work streams in the Zoom project is about procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at the life cycle of a BNF. How do I buy one? How do I upgrade it? How do I know how many I've got? How do I license it? All of these kind of aspects that you might think are a little boring compared to the, the technology of how to make it work, but boy, are they important to have a business. If I, if as a vendor, I don't know how to sell it and as a, uh, a service provider, a network operator, I don't know how to buy it, then uh, we really have a problem. So we tend to look both from the top down, and as you say, that kind of C-level view down, yeah. but we tend to look at all of the business aspects, both the, the IT side of things, the operation side of things, and also these kind of these pieces, these key pieces like procurement. Interesting. I mean, obviously with the Etsy aspect of this, I mean, you know, they are probably more focused on the standards aspect of this. And like you said, more of the technical aspect of it, uh, I, I guess, but there's always been talked about, you know, that, that the standards issues and inter interoperability issues, you know, those are at perhaps are perhaps um, uh, stifling a bit of the speed in which, you know, these virtualized platforms can be rolled out because you know, obviously operators, you know, prefer to have a standard or, you know, make sure that things are kind of, you know, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, interoperability issues won't be, won't be an issue going down, down the road. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, are you guys seeing any sort of, uh, uh, I guess, delays because of maybe Etsy having a lot on its plate and not being able to come up with these standards? Or uh, I guess, what's your general view of how that's all kind of playing out in, in the market? And I've, yeah, I've heard a lot of analysts and, and in the press, people talking about the, the delays of standards. Um, but if you talk to uh, operators, I couldn't find anybody who said, well, I'm waiting for the standards. Uh, nobody said that. They said, yeah, clearer standards would help. But, you know, I've got plenty of things that are slowing me down. Um, I mean, but we're trying to solve that problem. Yeah. Um, we're working very closely with Etsy in a couple of areas. Um, I mentioned the API work we're doing. That's really, really important from, uh, from our point of view. So we, we've opened up our APIs. And you'll see us talking a lot about this at our Nice event coming up in, uh, in just a couple of weeks' time now. Um, the, the APIs are really, really important because they're the key integration reference points. And we've made those an open standard. We've published those. And they dovetail pretty nicely with what Etsy are doing from the, the resource detailed management level. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a key piece that we're working on. The other piece that, um, that we're work, working on, uh, Etsy facilitated a meeting across SDOs to look for a common information model. And so we're, we're putting a lot of effort into contributing to that. Obviously, our information framework, formerly called the SID, yeah. um, is actually a pretty well-adopted standard amongst Telco and several other organizations like the, uh, the Metro Ethernet Forum um, and several other organizations have actually adopted early versions of the SID to build their information models on top. So we're, 
we're pushing quite hard to make some of that stuff that's very familiar to CSPs in the telecoms world, um, but also used elsewhere, making that the de facto standard. And we're working on a fragment to really solve that common information problem right now. So we're, we're doing what we can to, to add from our view to the various standards activities going on. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, we'd all like it to happen faster. My, I can't find an operator who tells me that's the one thing that they're waiting for, mind you. Interesting. Yeah. And, and again, like you said, I mean, this is obviously a very uh, transformational uh, move for operators. And yeah, I mean, it's going to take several years to do. So yeah, you're probably right. I mean, obviously there's so many other, other hurdles in, in place for operators as well. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it there. But I guess as you look at the overall ecosystem as well, does it seem like that the market out there, the, the vendor community out there, uh, obviously standards bodies, different organizations, um, is, is the support out there, do you think, in place today for operators to be fairly comfortable and confident in deploying uh, NFV uh, platforms on their networks? And do you think that, you know, going this early, perhaps in the process, is it, is it a, do you think a bit of a challenge or do you think that it's smart to go ahead and, and, and dive in now, get that experience and, and, the, and the market itself will evolve with what's being done today and not, and it won't become, you know, some sort of dead end uh, for an operator down the road if they go like a certain path today. Um, I think we're nearly there. Um, okay. It's interesting if you look at um, if, if you look at what people are doing today. You go back to this um, idea that people are, are deploying NFV, but they're not really using it as NFV. So I've got a virtual whatever my network element is, um, but I'm I'm kind of managing it and, and using it in my network as if it was a physical one. Okay. Um, if I take that uh, that concept, then what I have to do is find a way of 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 exploiting the power of that. Now, the ideal would be if I had a fully worked with everything, end-to-end -end orchestration management system that worked fully with hybrid, uh, fixed, and virtual. Um, I think we're a little way away from that just because of the legacy problem, because of the complexity. People are talking about thousands of systems in the legacy that have to be mopped up here. But I said I'd return to that point about hybrid. Another interesting thing that, that somebody explained to me is they said, well, hybrid doesn't have to occur at the bottom. So, so what do you mean by that? Well, what we all think about is say, well, let's say I'm doing SMS. Um, I just pull that idea out of there. So, and I've got virtual SMSCs and physical SMSCs. When people talk about hybrid, they talk about, okay, so I have to have people working between those two SMSCs. I have to have, um, both of those managed identically and people moving between them. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe I do the hybrid at the service level. So maybe what I do is I take a particular group of subscribers and I serve them on the virtual infrastructure. And I take a different group of subscribers, perhaps my existing bulk of subscribers, and I keep them on the physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. but in fact, I take the hybrid up. And that simplifies the problem a little bit. Now I can go back to that, that silo idea where I can say, okay, I've got this new service. Sure, it's gonna have to work in a hybrid way sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's gonna have to work with the existing billing or whatever, but, but so I can start to build services where actually a lot of it is virtual and I reduce the number of places I have to solve the hybrid challenge. That's an approach that, that's been suggested. I'm not sure I, I, I have an exact worked example of somebody doing that, but. But that made a number of us think, well, hang on a minute, there's, you know, we talk about hybrid management and we talk about solving the really hard problem first. Well, how about we just take a piece of it and serve, solve the easy problem first? And if I take this API centric mentality that I mentioned before and probably will return to, <laughs> provided I, I expose the right kind of APIs to manage around these things, then I can that's a really good way of, of, of doing that abstraction. And, and as long as those are open standards, then that shouldn't box me in too much. If I go with a proprietary set of APIs, if I go with a proprietary integration point, then maybe I'll end up with a bit of a challenge. But as long as I keep those integration points open uh, and to an open standard, provided I've got the common information models so of what I'm passing across them, then I think many of the pieces are in place. Lots of our members have service orchestration architectures out there. We've done sponsored webinars from HP, many other people recently about catalog systems, uh, service level orchestration driven by catalog. Those pieces are out there. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of deploying them in manageable chunks uh, rather than trying to, uh, to boil the ocean, if you like.
Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, because you know, it's always been talked about, you know, obviously with orchestration, you know, you want to make sure you get down to the core of this and be able to, you know, orchestrate things between legacy and the new platforms. But yeah, I guess if you can uh, start somewhere easy, uh, gain some experience from that, perhaps that jump later on to the, the harder part won't feel so hard because you've got, you've got at least some experience with deploying, you know, these platforms and kind of see what happens when you do it. So yeah, I guess it would seem like then at some point you could gain some a uh, little bit of experience, you know, get your toe in the water a little bit, feel how cold the water is or hot the water is, and and then when that when you make that big jump, you're not quite so surprised by what you by what you find. Yeah, and, and you can even start smaller than that. Um, mm. If you look at our Catalyst projects, so uh, I'm sure most people are aware, but just quickly, the the Catalyst projects are. Um, we call them rapid fire prototyping. It's about a bunch of companies coming together. We would usually have four or five vendors coming together. And there's always a sponsor who um, is typically a communication service provider. Um, and um, we, would, we would have them come together to solve a problem set by the, the, the sponsor. So the service provider says, I want to build this. And we work together to integrate using our standards, but also developing new standards as we go along. Um, to build these rapid proof of concepts. And at our upcoming Nice event, you'll see something like um, 10 of these. We've now done about 30 overall in the NFV agile ops kind of space. So we, we built these little proof of concepts and, and many of them are real running live systems um, that demonstrate some of these pieces. And you, you can see those elements there and take the learning from that take the best practices, all of that work contributes to our best practice guides, our common language and models, and start to use that learning to start to deploy bigger pilot and eventually full-blown um, commercial operations. So that that's quite a powerful approach. And, and you can see in the range of these, we've got um, one that's been running for a while. They've done multiple phases around virtual CPE. Uh, consumer premise equipment so mm -hmm. the, the fixed sector pulling a lot of the functionalities that run on your your home router your home gateway pulling those back into the cloud we did that as a feasibility exercise initially but where those guys are now is starting to look at well what's the customer service benefit of that how can i assure the service is better how can i create a dashboard and they're looking towards how i can just use analytics to drive the customer experience understand where people aren't getting the best service so we see many of these kind of proof of concept levels around specific areas. CPE is something that at least two operators I know of uh, have already started to virtualize in their live networks. And we're going further with the catalysts and showing how you can actually derive real customer benefits from that. Yeah, and, and again, like you're saying, those kind of events, you know, see those at the, at the show coming up here. And I, you know, I've been to the past few years to the events. And obviously, you have the catalyst, the catalyst that you guys show there are always very interesting. Because again, like you said, you have a sponsor that's usually a CSP uh, that's really, you know, trying to, drive, trying to drive a solution. And you get the vendors in there to help them out. And, and they're always really interesting to see. But yeah, I guess before we let you go, let's talk a bit about the show coming up. Because again, like I said, I've been to there the past couple of years. And it's always, it seems like an, it's an event that is, is very focused. I mean, it's not like a, like a very general trade show type event that you go to where you might get some information here, might, might get some information there. It's a very focused event that seems to really uh, uh, dial in on, on, on specific issues that operators are facing. And obviously, NFV is a big part of it now. I, I guess for a company that might be going to maybe its first uh, team form event this year, what, what should they expect to get out of the show? And, and maybe what should they, you know, again, it'll be different from a traditional trade show. Uh, what should they expect to, to kind of see at, at the event this year? Well, I think the most interesting thing is it, it, it's really about peer-to-peer -peer conversations. As you say, it's not a conventional trade show. This yeah. isn't showing off their latest wares. <laughs> this is really about peer-to-peer -peer conversations. And you say it's focused. And indeed, it is focused on digital services. But if you look at the breadth we cover now, so we have smart cities, sure. we have internet of everything. Uh, we're even looking at some, some areas like smart health, smart climate, some of these kind of verticals now. But a big chunk of it is around the, the underlying digital services proposition. So we have a, a track on um, agile operations. So that operational transformation I talked about. We have a, a track on IT transformation. So this is very much about how the, the systems that support those operations are going to transform. Um, we're looking at platform architectures. We're looking at service-based architectures. Uh, there'll be a good look, talk about API standards in that, of course. And then we've got a specific track on NFV and SDN. And um, a lot of that is really interesting. It's about people sharing their experiences. This is people who are already on the journey, sharing their experiences 
uh, sharing what they did and what they learned along the way and talking about what they're going to get do next. And we have a number of panel discussions where we've got industry experts, not just from the telecom space, but also bringing people in from the wider um, digital services industry to, to share their experience. It, it's really interesting if you look at some of the, the hyperscale data center players, the cloud players, if mm -hmm. you like, um, the Microsofts of the world. Some of the things we're looking to do in the communications space, they've sort of solved in the, um, in the hyperscale data center. Now, that there are some differences, but there's a huge amount we can learn from each other. And, and it's that sort of information sharing that goes on. So we talk about connecting ecosystems. It's really about learning from people both within your own ecosystem, but also learning from, from others about how you can transform your business and thrive in this new digital marketplace, in this new value fabric with all this new enabling technology. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think TM Forum is at a nice uh, kind of intersection there because you guys do have experience from, it seems like from both sides of the, of the, of the model there where, you know, you, again, you deal with a lot with the companies that are in the data center space that have all this experience that they kind of know, they know this journey. They've been there before. They know what to expect. But then you've got the telecom guys who, uh, you know, we can always admit are, are somewhat conservative, uh, don't like big changes, but they know they need to make this change. And so to be able to kind of transition or translate what's already been learned to what operators need to know and kind of knowing, knowing the, the operator's uh, own timeframes and their own, own operating systems, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting way to kind of combine those together. And again, I think, you know, for myself, when I've attended, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that I understand and a lot of things that, that I don't understand, which I think is probably uh, better for those who want to get some insight because uh, I think their level of uh, wanting to learn stuff is obviously above mine. And so uh, I think people will learn, you know, some basics, which is what I usually understand, and then also get some insight into some of the more uh, uh, difficult questions, which are again, the ones over my head, but I think are the issues that uh, people need to kind of find out about. And obviously, operators need to kind of get, get their head around. So, so yeah, like I said, it's, it's a, always a great event. It's always something you can learn something from. So it sounds like, again, it'll be another, another good event this year for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the thing I love about it is is the breadth. So you'll yeah. you'll find a catalyst mm -hmm. talking about microservices under Docker and how they're orchestrating them together and how their intent based policy modeling uh, is being used and what they're contributing back to our information standards. I mean, this is detailed technical work building yeah. architectures of the future. And then you can walk from there and you can go into a conversation in the uh, in the five G track, shall we say? And uh, I've just been talking to a couple of colleagues. We're going to have a panel on the economics of 5G. Yeah. So 5G is going to be a lot of shared infrastructure. How's the economics of that going to work? Who's going to make the investment? Where's the revenue going to come from? So that's a, that's a macroeconomic business discussion uh, that'll be happening a few feet away from a, um, a detailed technical architecture discussion. And we have absolutely everything in between as well. So um, yeah. it, it's that breadth, it's, but it's all about, it, it, it's the business side of it. It's, it's how do we make, how do we make real business? How do we actually operate this stuff and how do we make money out of it? Yeah, it's a good point. I, mean, I guess I should have mentioned like when, when I said it was focused, I, I, I should say it's focused on, on what people probably need to learn as opposed to just general fluff about what's happening in the industry. You know, obviously 5G is a big part of it, but you guys really seem to kind of zero in on the opportunities of 5G, not just, Hey, you know, this is what 5G is going to be and this and that it's, it's a focused event in terms of yeah, being able to really, get stuff out of it that you really need for your operations, not just stuff that you, you know, that you can get out of any, any sort of publication somewhere else. So that, that's a big part of it. That's certainly what we try to create, yeah. Very good. Well, again, Barry, definitely appreciate the great insight on this today. Obviously, a lot going on in this space. I know the TM Forum has been at the center of a lot of this as well. It seems like you guys are working with a lot of organizations, with Etsy, obviously, with your, with your own uh, members as well on, on driving this. So uh, we definitely appreciate the great insight on this today. And, I, and again, good luck with the show coming up. And uh, hopefully we can touch base again soon, perhaps after the event, and get kind of a wrap up from you guys on, on what happened and uh, get some more details there. But, but again, we definitely appreciate the time and insight today. Well, some great insight there from Barry on connecting NFE Islands, as well as looking ahead to uh, the TM Forum Live event next week in uh, Nice, France. Our colleague here, uh, Sean Kenny, will be on site uh, covering the event, so make sure to check us out for all the news from the, from the event. Well, and also make sure to check us out again next week on, on the next episode of NFES in Reality Check. And we are scheduled to speak with Versa Networks on the importance of testing and inter interoperability for NFV and SDN. Thanks again for watching. NFV SDN Reality Check with Dan Meyer is a production of RCR TV. To suggest show topics or to reach Dan, you can find him on email dmeyer at rcrwireless.com and on Twitter at Meyer underscore Dan.
For more Dan, news on NFBSDN and everything wireless, find your way over to rcrwireless.com.